And when I was climbing it, the rope flicked a, a, a flake of rock off about the size of a laptop computer, and it, and it struck me in the head. Um, kind of scythe straight into my skull. And I didn't hear it coming or the, the, the next thing I knew, I was upside down on the rope, a meter above the water with, with blood pouring out of my head into the sea. Welcome to the To Be Human podcast, Paul. Thank you, Jenna. Good to see you. Good to see you, Paul. So, Paul, I came across you first in Australian Geographic and your story truly touched my heart. And I know that it did this at a deep level because I find it really hard to find the words to share with you how much I appreciate and am grateful for you sharing your story and the lessons that you've learned. And where I would like to start, Paul, is you said, I was an adventurer before my accident and I am an adventurer now. So, Paul, I would love to know who was the Paul, the, the adventurer before your accident? Well, that must have been a long time ago, Australian Geographic printed that, but anyway, <laughs> um, I was... I climbed every day on cliffs or mountains for 15 years before my accident as a as a professional mountaineer um, in terms of guiding and and sponsorship deals where you might, I, I would be that poster boy kind of um, advertising advertising ropes or climbing shoes in magazines. Um, and I, I lived very much full tilt, kind of um, a million miles an hour, really. And, and, um, and I had tons of adventures and ton and, and, which involved a fair, its fair share of of scrapes with 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 death, or with my mortality, I should say. Um, and I think that I realise now that that's probably not the not an optimal way to go about to go about living. And what do you think in those early days of adventure, what do you think really pulled you in that? What was it about adventure that you loved? I think adventure is is a is a is, is a broad word and and maybe not the not a, a good word in in lots of cases. I I don't know what what an, what another word would be actually, but basically I was I just fell in love with climbing from the age of fifteen, rock climbing, and then and then I started mountaineering in nineteen ninety, and and um. And yeah, it just it just consumed my life. Um, and I didn't really know why at the time, but 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 now kind of looking back 30 years, I can see that that I was absorbing all this all this all this all this um energy from the landscape almost kind of like powerful mm -hmm. powerful stuff um when you're when you're maybe 90 feet 
nine, what's that, 30 meters off the off the ground, kind of um, hanging on with your with your fingertips and knowing that if you fall, you you die. Um, mm. It's it's actually it's actually a um, really powerful thing. Um, and it's and it's almost well, it is mind training in in a very yogic sense. So so um, I didn't realize then, but I was doing I was basically doing a meditation practice um, for twelve hours a day every day, basically. Mm. Yeah, I I feel like that's such a beautiful point because. In any experience that I've sort of felt that risk of life and death, there is that feeling of feeling so alive and so present in those moments. There's something that is very pulling towards those experiences. So I I know that you wrote your first book and what sort of pulled you towards writing a book in those earlier days? Well, it was very simple, actually. I, I, one of the ways in which a professional climber in those days could make money is by, is by su- submitting stories and articles to magazines. And so my first book was a collection of, of stories that was pulled together from magazines. Um, but it won an award. And it was, and it was with that prize money that me and my partner Celia found ourselves in Australia. Because uh, I, I should say I'm, I'm from the UK originally, um, and and um, that just sent me on in a whole different direction then, but. But yeah, that uh, that that book, Deep Play, it's called it. It's um, it. Well, I guess I guess that I couldn't climb anymore, or found it really difficult to climb, and and because I'd won an award at writing, I I felt I felt um that. At least I could do. At least I could still write. And luckily for me, my brain was after after the brain injury. Oh no, I'm going ahead of myself now, aren't I? But uh, we don't we don't know about the brain injury yet. But um, <laughs> but but I had a massive brain injury, and that is why I'm that's why I'm very slow. Um, and, and so luckily my, my brain seemed to still be as intelligent as it ever was. Um, it's not the case with all brain injuries by, by any means. Um, and so I, I can still write. Mm. I think this, that's so beautiful. And in winning the literature award, as you shared, you had prize money. What was your intention in using that prize money that had you land in Tasmania? Well, at that point, I was I was doing probably four four expeditions a year to to all sorts of all sorts of places and so we were on a round the world expedition which started in Borneo and um, Mount Kinabalu where we did lots of climbing on on these kind of crazy pinnacles right on the summit of Mount Kinabalu and then and then we were going to go on a round the world uh, round Australia tour before flying to 
Alaska where it was going to be the season for 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 um mountains in Alaska but all that turned on its head when when I found, when we got to Tasmania and we were trying we were trying actually the second second free ascent so which means like second people to climb up the totem pole it's called it's quite a remote place um with only our hands and feet um i hope that you'll show a picture of the totem pole sure <laughs> because it's um it's an incredible thing it's it's 65 meters high and only four meters wide it's so slender that it, it sways slightly when you stood on top of it um and and it's on the end of Cape Hoy on the Tasman Peninsula, um, quite near Port Arthur. But it was a different place back then. In 1998, this was because it was a long time before the Three Capes track or even mobile phones. So, um, so it was a hell of a place to have an accident, that's for sure. And so you went with your partner at the time, Celia, can you share with us more about that day that is became so defining in your life? Yeah, I think I have to do that, don't I? So, so um, it was just me and Celia down there, and we had to fight our way to the top of the Cape um, because because it was a long time before the Three Capes track, and um, and then. And then we had to abseil in, and and Celia was at this halfway ledge. It's two, it's two what you call pitches or kind of rope lengths the the totem pole, and um, and it it sticks straight out of the sea, and and it's in this kind of gap with 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 rushing water all around it. And, um, and Celia, was at, Celia got up to the halfway ledge and, and when I was climbing it, the rope flicked a, a, a flake of rock off about the size of a laptop computer and it, and it struck me in the head. Um, kind of sighed straight into my skull and I didn't hear it coming or the, the, the next thing I knew, I was upside down on the rope, a meter above the water with, with blood pouring out of my head into the sea. And then I passed out again for a few minutes, well, for a, probably half an hour. And then, and then I sensed Celia by me and she, she was, she got me upright in the slings. She kind of come down on a rope as well. And then, and she put her helmet on my head. And then she climbed back up to the, the ledge. And normally what would happen is that you would look, she would have just lowered me down to the ground. And in, 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 in an, that kind of situation, but because it it was sticking straight out of the sea, and there's only me and her down there, she had to haul me up to the ledge, thirty meters up a vertical wall, on a single nylon nine millimeter rope. And so, so by the time she got me there, three hours later, her hands were bleeding. She had to make me safe on the ledge. I must say that that was the first time that I realized that something was seriously wrong with my body. She said, she said, you're going to have to help me here. If we're going to get you out of this, you're screaming at me. And, um, and, and, um, and, and she, um, and, and I, I realized that my, my arm and leg weren't, weren't working. They were like pieces of wood. And, she got me onto the ledge, made me safe, but then she had to go and 
go and get help because as I say, it was in the days before her mobile phones. So she had to run six and a half kilometers over a mountain to get to get help back from the Cape um, to the nearest ranger station, Fortescue Bay. Um, when, well, it, it was 10 hours later by the time a, a helicopter got to me and, and rescued me. Um, so it was, well, I'd lost half my blood. When, when the rescue came, the paramedic, he had, he, he had to ab, abseil down to me and he thought that it was, he thought that it was going to be a, 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 a simple kind of corpse recovery, judging by the amount of blood on the ledge. And when, when he realized that I was still alive, he, he, um, knew that there was no time to lose and, and he he clipped me to his harness and we both we both abseiled or you know des descended a rope down to down to this tinny that had been co-opted as a as a rescue boat and and that 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 tinny was going up and down on us on the swell six, uh, two meters so on the upsurge, he had he cut the rope, and we both fell into the boat on the, and then the, it's really exciting. <laughs> um, I can remember that. I can wow. remember the I can remember bouncing around on the waves as, as the as the as the helicopter as the um, motorboat sped to yeah, waiting helicopter on. Fortescue Bay Beach, yeah, and that's, I guess that's the story of, of my accident. It's an incredible story and it's actually for me so surprising that you were conscious for for a lot of that. It's it's quite amazing. So in your recovery, Paul, what were the earlier days like in, in beginning to truly realise the effects of this accident? I was in, I was in a kind of induced coma for about a week, and then when I woke up, I didn't, I didn't know where I was or what was going on. I, I thought that it was like some kind of nightmare, and I thought that the this nurse had it in for me and was trying to kill me, and and it it, it was very very terrifying. I think maybe that was. The, some kind of hallucination, hallucinations from the from the drugs that I was on, um, and then straight away I was urged to get moving. I must say though, I, I remember I remember my leg falling out of bed once and. And um, and and when I look when I looked down, I couldn't see my leg, and and because it had no feeling in it, and and I thought I thought, oh my god, my my leg's gone. They've chopped my leg wow. off, and then went back to sleep again. And kind of, <laughs> um, um, and anyway, after after six weeks in the Royal Hobart, I was I was deemed fit to go home back to Britain where I and that's where I spent a year in hospital um because I'd, I'd I'd done myself a real a real injury you know kind of like I, it's it is it is um pretty uh, I feel very very lucky to be alive every day and that's that's one of the things that spurs me on, you know, just kind of how close I got to to dying. Mm. Um, and that's just informed my, my my whole philosophy on now on on life and death. 
Mm. How has that influenced your philosophy on life and death? How has it changed for you since that accident? Well, since that accident, I I realised that, that I guess I've I've just learned how to accept everything. So, like, I do. It is radical acceptance. I know that's a that's a uh, that's a, a well hackneyed term from from. Um, Oh, maybe Brenny Brown or someone, but um, Tara but um, Brock. or Tara Brack, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but but it's it's so it's so apt. Um, if you do that with that acceptance, come comes comes this courage to to. Oh no, I'm just I'm. I'm kind of paraphrasing what I said in, in the film. Doing it scared now, but um, but like the courage to the courage to um, navigate the the necessary stumbling stones of life that that we're all going to face. I mean, nobody has nobody has an easy life. That's like a one hundred and one kind of lesson that 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 I've been taught kind of quite early on in my life. Yeah, it is a, a one on one oh one lesson. I feel like we hear it regularly, but I certainly feel like it is one of the more challenging lessons to actually apply in life, particularly when your life changes so much. And Paul, I, I asked you before recording that I'd like to share a paragraph of your upcoming book, The Mountain Path, that does talk about this acceptance. So I'll just Give it a little yeah. read. My experience on the totem pole taught me to be unwavering in the face of difficulty and hardship. It taught me the importance of total acceptance of the way things are at this very moment. The more we can accept the pain, be it physical or emotional, the more we understand that it will pass. Nothing is fixed and unchanging from the pain in our bodies or minds to our existence as a physical body, which will eventually become compost. <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I love that in part. It's my favorite. <laughs> Can you share, Paul, yeah. more about you know, that paragraph and, and, you know, the power of acceptance in your life? Well, I must say that I can't just say things like that um, <laughs> um, because my brain only works at about half the speed, but I, I've only got half a body so I can type. I can type about the same speed as my brain works. But mm -hmm. but um, I think it's important to to accept... I think we're we're very good at, at accepting the good parts of our life, aren't we? And 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 pretty bad at accepting at accepting the the disappointing parts of our life. Do you feel, Paul, that you have to pull on that lesson of acceptance every day? So every day, almost without fail, I. I fall over, um, and sometimes break my nose. Sometimes, sometimes um, crack my ribs. And and if you, I've got to accept that that that's who I am, and 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 just roll with it, or else or else, if what's the options are to to become bitter and twisted, and um, and for some reason I'm struggling here. But okay. um, can you ask me that question again? Do you feel like you have to pull on that lesson of acceptance in your daily life? 
So you shared about yeah. falling over and hurting yourself. Mm. Is it something yeah. that you feel like is within you now or is it something that still is a daily practice? So with, I think that it's got to be a daily practice, but with, with me, I guess acceptance, with that acceptance, well, falling over every day, I've got to I've got to be really determined to get back up but also really patient to to um to navigate the next few weeks where 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 I'm where I'm kind of sore and not able to do any exercise and and um and I know that's the situation for lots of people with disabilities um but it it makes you stronger, mm. and it makes you more more able to roll to roll with everything, to just roll with the good and bad. And so, so I actually think this, this is a bit off topic, but I actually think that. People with disabilities are, are often very, very capable and strong people, and and the the fifty seven percent or whatever it is um, unemployment rate in Australia doesn't reflect. You know, yeah. I love that you mentioned that because I know that you went to Nepal with your son Eli, and part of that trip was to show that sort of being disabled is not a drawback when it comes to being a father and providing the family with the experiences that you want. Can you share more about that experience with Eli? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a coming of age trip for Eli. Um, He had his 13th birthday on top of a Himalayan peak and and um, it took sixteen days to get there, and 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 it was it was I mean it blew Eli's mind. I've been I've been I've been there lots in my in my professional capacity kind of years ago, um, but but um. It was wonderful to see, and 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 he even had a cake on top of on top of the mountain. It was it was absolutely beautiful. Um, but I mean, be, being disabled doesn't mean that you're unable. Mm. And that's that's my mantra. Mm-hmm. Really. Mm. And what do you think? was one of the more important lessons that Eli learned from that trip and being doing something so amazing with his father. Well, it definitely brought us close closer mm. together. Um, and I think it taught him how to be resilient a bit more. And I mean, it's, it's an ongoing kind of project, isn't it? But, um, mm. um, you know, he, he just had to kind of get up and start walking again, even though he had a headache and a, and um, and and was throwing up or something, you know. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So we'll see. It's it. We've not been able to do anything like that for quite for a while now. Mm. That was in 2019. So that was the last time that I left out that me me and that any of us left at Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, life's certainly been different. So acceptance is such a important lesson that you share that I certainly um, have really taken on from your message. And another that was really important to me is you said, let the future go 
without anticipating it all the time. Can you talk to me about, I suppose, you know, the power of now and being really present in your life? So because, because I think at half the speed and, and I'm a lot slower than, than many people, I, um, I do, do actually see things that other people might miss. And not just not just um, physical things in the landscape, or which I do. I think maybe I do see more than a lot of people. But um, but kind of you know the micro expressions that 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 people might might have. So mm. so I think I'm a fairly a fairly good judge of kind of the mood of, of, of situations um, and I think that that is a symptom of presence of, be, of being present um, oh no I'm I don't know why but I'm just I'm you're gonna, you're gonna have a real job <laughs> it's easy it's fine with, with it's definitely putting yourself in the arena, but I mean, it you know, it's all part of the experience, right? This is all part of the story and the journey and, you know, I think it's really beautiful and it's really authentic. And if, yeah, I mean, people, if people realise that I've only got half a brain, then I've <laughs> 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 had half my head removed and it's, yeah. um, it's quite- it's, it's plastic now, my brain. It's like, yeah. Wow. Like my, my, my skull. Yeah. Well, what I really love about it, Paul, is your writing. You know, as you said, it's like you may not be able to speak at the speed that you wish, but you're able to formulate those words in written word. And I think I heard you say you typed with one finger like a million words or something, which is incredible yeah. what is your relationship to writing now because to my understanding you have four books now yeah um well it's i get i get up at generally at about five o'clock in the morning I, I i meditate for the best part of an hour and then and then i get to my writing and um and and so that's kind of my daily life until until about noon when I, when I'm when I'm shot and then mm. and then I'll, I'll have a rest. But um, so it, it's all consuming. But you know that that this book, the Mountain Path, it took me six and a half years to write. So it's mm. I write really slowly and re- in a very considered manner. Hmm. It's certainly a an experience of endurance in itself. I would love to ask you the way in which I am so impressed by you and really honor you is your ability to overcome adversity in such an admirable way, truly. And life has been challenging for many people right now. What would be your advice for anyone that is going through any form of adversity at the moment? I think it'd be exactly what we've just been talking about, really, to um, find a way to accept what is what is going on. Acceptance doesn't mean resignation. Mm. Um, so, with acceptance, you can still you can still protest you can still um that might be that might be a a a strong word at the moment actually because i don't mean (laughs) (laughs) it's it's a sensitive uh, word right now (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. um (laughs) um you can you can still change things it still opens the door to change so not not like Mm. not resignation um and 
I've forgotten what you, I've forgotten what you what you what you asked actually. Just about overcoming adversity. And if you if you if you realize that everything changes and 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 that it's just this moment every every moment is just the next moment then mm. then that's all that exists then then um you realize that this next moment is beautiful and 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 um and so it it puts you in a in a greater state of mind i think i think it is one of the most powerful lessons that anybody can take in Paul and I certainly utilize that in my own life we are only ever in our present and I think when you truly truly understand that and can live by that um, life is so much more beautiful and peaceful and connecting and loving so I love that thank you Paul do you want me to talk about my ascent of the to- my 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 climb of the totem pole eighteen years after my accident? Yes, please. Because that that just ties in. It is. Mm-hmm. Um. So, eighteen years after my accident, I went back and I, and I went and 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 climbed this thing, the totem pole with with only half a body, basically, and um. And it was a very, very important thing for me to do to revisit, to revisit and go back to something that had done me so much harm. Um, I remember taking the the swing that that resulted in the rock falling off off on me, and and like I flinched when when I when I um, when I took that swing, and then and then. Further up, I felt the hole where the rock had had fallen from, and and um, and then getting onto the ledge, I could I could hear Celia's voice in 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 my in my head, even though she was she was nowhere near. She she lives in Scotland now, but I could hear her. I mean, I think what she did on that day was was one of the most incredible cliff rescues in 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 history it was just, you know and i owe, totally owe my life to her um and then it was 126 one arm pull ups that i did up that rope and and um and when i finally you know collapsed onto the summit it was like a 18 year loop or our circle was finally closed and since then i've i've, I've that was in 2016, and since then, I've actually my life has improved. I've, I've not been so I've not been so fearful, or um, I've, I've moved to another level, shall we say, of of, of um, acceptance. Yeah, and that's mm. that's been so important for me. Yeah, it's so powerful mm. to think of returning. And succeeding in that space that was so life changing for you, that that brings in mm. that element of courage that you live by. Yeah, and I think I think in 2016 that um, we made an Australian story about it, and 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 um, I got so many. It was it struck a chord with with the with with people and mm. and um for a brief period i was flooded with 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 them um, with well wishes and, and from 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 total strangers you know it's it a beautiful thing mm. and when you hear from those people what are they thankful for in learning from you and seeing you do such an incredible thing well there was a lot there was a lot of you know you you're a bloody inspiration, mate, <laughs> and, um, mm. and um, and I know that that is, that's a really um, oh, what's the word? That's not for most people with disabilities. That's a, that's a very a very um, tenuous, shall we say, term to use. You know, inspiration is this whole thing about inspiration 
pawn, but I, I um, I think I, I don't I don't really get that. I think that I think that I'm inspired by other people, and I'm I'm glad that I can inspire somebody else. Um, and it's just that's just the way it is. You are such an incredible inspiration, Paul. And as shared at the beginning of this podcast, you truly did touch my heart. And I, I certainly feel like you have improved my, my life through the lessons that I've learned through your story. So I can certainly advocate for you to continue sharing your story and your continual lessons and adventures with other people because it certainly is life-changing. Oh, thanks, Jenna. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you for all the beautiful and very strong lessons that you've shared, Paul. I truly appreciate you being here. And I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you, Paul, to be human? I had to think, I had to think quite a lot about this, but for me, to be, to be human, um, I think it, it's the ability to act courageously and so to go against your fear and maybe like uh, you know to go into a burning building to rescue a child um, it, when every fiber of your being is telling you not to go in there um, I think not not many animals, there's probably some, but not many animals can do that, non-human animals. So I think that to be born human into this human body is a really precious thing, very precious. Um, and so I think that's what another hackneyed phrase, but I, I, but at the title of a of, of film I'm in, um, that doing it scared is, um, mm. I think that's actually what that, what that means to be human, to the ability to just do it scared. <laughs>